You know what I want you to do? I want you to take your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes. Or for those of you who don't know any better, Ecclesiastics. And uh, there's a verse here, just bless me today. I had, I had had some good study time today and I was glad to get it. I needed it. I needed it. Yeah, I, actually, that's where the verse was I was thinking of in Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Because um, we're studying the doctrine of the Bible. And Ecclesiastes 1 starts out with the words of the preacher. And I, I want to say this uh, by way of encouragement to any preacher uh, who may be listening to this um, you know, the recording of it, um, I'm assuming you'd be at your own church tonight. Um, but I remember when this hit me one year, I was sitting out on my deer stand, Brother George, which is probably why I didn't kill a deer that year. I was too busy reading the Bible. But it was, it's, it was a good exchange. And I opened up to Ecclesiastes and it said the words of the preacher. And the Holy Ghost just said to me, Mike, you're not the preacher. Jesus is. Jesus is the preacher. But the words that you're to preach are to be these words that are in this book. If, if I'm going to preach, then I have to preach the words of the preacher. Not my own thoughts, not my own ideas, not my own philosophies oh i think god is like this or god is like that and then that's how he starts ecclesiastes and then he ends it with uh the 12th chapter which is the last chapter in verse 10 uh the preacher sought to find out acceptable words so us preachers we look for things to say to our people that we that they need to hear uh, there's a verse in the Bible, and I'm going to butcher it up real bad because I can't remember it verbatim, but the shepherd needs to know the state of his flocks. Okay, how his, how his flocks are doing. So the, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The only acceptable words the preacher ought to preach are the words that are truth, which is, Jesus said, thy word is truth. And then verse 11, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails. That's the verse I was trying to think of a while ago. Uh, as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. The, mas the, the builder is Jesus. Notice his dad, what was the trade of Joseph? He's a carpenter. And so Jesus probably knew a little bit about nails. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And the one shepherd is Jesus. We don't read the Bible, then read the words of Gandhi, and then the Bhagavad Gita, and then the Talmud, and then any other, and the Koran, and any other religious book. The words that the preachers ought to be preaching should only come from one shepherd only. And that is Jesus Christ. And those words are as nails that will fasten us in place and cause us to not move away from the gospel. Somebody say amen. So that's, that's something I, God dealt with me about today and I was glad to get it. All right. So. The Bible. What do we believe about the Bible? We started on this, on this particular part of it last Wednesday night, uh, and we'll just kind of run through this as a way of getting into the next part. But the three primary doctrines that we believe about the Bible come from the Bible. And that is, number one, the doctrine of the inspiration of the original manuscripts. That's number one. Number two, the preservation of every word of God preserved throughout all generations. And then number three, the correct translation of those words. If they're not translated correctly for us, how then can we know what God really said? 
And so the, uh, what I believe about my Bible is going to come to me from my Bible. I, I had to forget, or I had, I'll say it this way, I had to forsake what I learned in Bible college. I had to walk away from that. Because what I learned there was not true according to what I read in the Word of God. So I'm, I'm thankful that I did. Let's go to the, the Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, Father, first of all, we want to thank you for allowing us to come into your place tonight, into your house. And Father, none of us deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. Nobody does. We thank you for the people that are watching with us online. We pray that you bless all of them, bless these families. And Father, we pray for our two uh, orphaned children in Kenya that both have malaria. Father, we lift them up before you tonight. We ask you to pray that you would bless them, that you would give them healing, Father. And... Uh, so many people out in that part of the world can get malaria and die from it. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would spare these children's lives and heal them, Lord, of this terrible disease. And uh, Father, get them back on their feet, playing, running around like children are supposed to do, having fun and not having the cares of this world. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless them tonight. Father, we pray that you'd bless your word and open it up to our ears and our hearts and our understanding. Help us, dear God, to be to stand fast and to be fastened as a, like a nail in a sure place, Lord, that we be not moved away from the things that we've been taught, the things, God, that you have taught us in your word, the things that we're supposed to believe. Help us to not be moved away from these things. Bless and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. So number one, again, I, I started on this last Wednesday. I want to run through this very quickly. Number one, the inspiration of the original manuscripts, uh, what, uh, what Peter wrote on, what James wrote on, what Isaiah wrote on, what Moses wrote on. All of those things were the inspired word of God. Second Timothy 316, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, second Peter, I'm going to move through this very fast. So uh, if you want to keep up, that's fine. But second Peter one twenty one for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy ghost. So we believe that the very words, not just the thoughts, but the God didn't just send down a thought and then allowed the men to write it out in whatever words they chose. God sent down the very words that he wanted them to write down. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. The very words. God said it's his very words, not his thoughts, not his philosophies, not some generic thought bubble that like you see in a comic book or whatever, but the exact words that God wanted are the words that those men spoke. We use the term verbatim. If we quote somebody, is, is that a direct quote? That is verbatim. In other words, that is a word for word quotation of exactly what he said. Courts in this country, every courtroom Every session of every congressional meeting in this country, every word is recorded. Every word is recorded for posterity. Those words mean something. So the very words that God wanted, he put them in Jeremiah's mouth and Jeremiah spake those very words. Uh, Ezekiel 2, 7. Thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear. They're most rebellious. And I've had people give me the argument. Well, I don't, you know, we don't necessarily give them scripture uh, in our church services because we have people there who wouldn't understand it to begin with. That is not your place to decide what you're going to say. I had a guy tell me that he did not use scripture when he led people to Jesus. He used terms that he knew they would understand. And I'm going, they're not saved. You cannot be saved without the word of God. And it is not up to us to decide whether or not they will understand God's word. God can make, God made me understand the word of God when I was nine years old and I got saved. 
I understood enough to know that I was a sinner. I was going to hell. I knew that. So anyway, speak my words unto them. Ezekiel 2, verse 9. And when he looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So in chapter 3, verse 1, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he calls me to eat that roll. Verse 4, he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. The exact words of God was what he sent down from heaven for those men to both speak and to write down. Then the inspired words were written. Exodus 17, verse 14. I'm not sure that I got into this part of it uh, last week. But uh, Exodus 17, 14. The Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Study the word remember, memorial, things like that. Peter often said in First and Second Peter that I'm stirring up your remembrance. I know I've said this before, but I'm repeating it again because it's important. I mean to stir it up in your mind and remember it. When you have read the Bible, what do you do then? Close it, put it on the shelf and walk away? No, go back and read it again. Remember what you had read before and take notes and then go back and read what, what God said to you last year. You, maybe you've changed your mind about something or maybe God's added something to it. But they are to be written down as a memorial for all generations. Exodus 34, 27, the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And I mentioned uh, here a while back the uh, difference between an oral agreement and a written agreement. A written agreement will have much more force of law behind it because those words cannot be altered once they're written on a page. It's not, they're not easily changed. Oral agreements, as soon as the words are spoken, almost that quick, they're gone. And unless you have a photographic memory to remember everything that somebody said, which I don't have that, it's best to write those words down. And what God did was when he sent a covenant with Moses, he had the words of that covenant written down. So there was no misunderstanding what God's responsibility was, what their responsibility was. Isaiah 8, 1. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll and write in it with a man's pen concerning Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table or a tablet. Or write it down. Write these words down, he said. Um, Jeremiah chapter 30 and then turn to, turn to Jeremiah 36. There's some good places there in Jeremiah. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 30 verse two says, thus speak of the Lord God of Israel saying, write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. So we know from the beginning of Jeremiah that God took his words, put them in the mouth of Jeremiah and he said, go speak. But then he tells him in chapter 30, take the words that I've given to you and write them down and put them into a book so that they can continue on past this particular day. I mean, how many chapters does Jeremiah have in it? 52, I think. 52 chapters in Jeremiah. What if God gave Jeremiah those words, all 52 chapters in one day? And then he said, Jeremiah, now don't forget all of these. Yeah, 52 chapters in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, now don't forget these is important. There's no way he could remember 52 chapters worth of words in one day. So God said, write them down. Write them down. And this is God beginning the process of preserving what it was that he said. But the original manuscripts were the inspired word of God. Every word of it. Um, in this, I think I would, from what I've heard, as a man by the name of Peter Ruckman, who has a, who he, he's now dead, but he had a church down in Pensacola, Florida. And from things that I've heard, I, I haven't physically heard him say this, but people have told me that Ruckman believed 
that the King James was actually better than the originals in Hebrew and Greek. That the King James would correct the Hebrew and Greek. And I do not believe that. That is not biblical. I do not agree with that. God spoke to the Jews in Hebrew, and he gave them Hebrew words, and those words were written down. And as they were written down, they were absolutely 100% perfect. They were infallible. They were without any error whatsoever. So I do not believe that the King James can be used to correct the Hebrew or the Greek, the Hebrew Old Testament or the Greek New Testament. I do not believe that. The words that God sent down to Jeremiah that he wrote down, they were the very words of God and they were words of truth. Okay? So write all these words down. Now Jeremiah 36. Because Jeremiah 36, verse 2, God tells him, uh, Take thee a roll of a book, write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spoke unto thee, from the day of Josiah, even unto this day. Verse 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Look at the reason why God wants those words written down. How many times you find the word hell in the Bible? 54 times. And God has that in there as a reminder to us what to avoid. Hell fire. The lake of fire. To warn us against the judgment of living a sinful life. God not only wanted it for those people who would hear it that day, but for the people who would listen to it from days way past that, God said in Ezekiel 33, I get no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I want the wicked to turn from his wickedness and turn to righteousness. I'm offering you a chance of mercy. And I'm writing these words down to you as a warning of what will happen if you don't follow what I say. I'm giving you a chance to repent. I'm, I'm a merciful God. Take that home with you tonight. God is a merciful God. Amen. So, verse... What happened here? Uh, where am I going to find that? Verse 6, turn to verse 16. Is that what I'm looking for? Is this, I'm looking for the place where Jehoiakim... Verse 27. No, 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 no. Where is it? Where is it that the king took his pen knife out and cut it up? Huh? 23. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a pen knife and cast it in the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. That was in Jehoiakim's mind. I cut it up, throw it in the fire. Now God can't do that to me. That was his thinking. These words, I've burnt them. They're of no effect to me whatsoever. Therefore, I'm safe from the judgment of God. So God said, well, Jeremiah, here's what I want you to do. Uh, verse 28. Take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord, thou hast burned this roll, saying, why hast thou written therein, saying, the king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of, of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat. And in the night to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, upon the men of Judah and all the evil that I have pronounced against them. But they hearken not. Verse 32. Then Jeremiah took another roll and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides them unto them many like words. So here's what God is establishing here. Number one, that His word comes down from heaven, 
And that word was written down. God anticipated that men were going to hate it. Devils hate it. They're afraid of it. Jezebel, Mystery Babylon, hates the written word of God. So they seek to destroy it. This is why the tares were sown in among the wheat. Seeking to destroy the word of God. So God is establishing a premise here, an idea. If you destroy this copy of the words that I spoke, God's saying, I'm not going to forget what I said. And if you happen to destroy this copy of it, I'll just have somebody else write down another copy of it. And God was establishing here the principle of not only writing the originals down, but in the, in the knowledge, God knew that the original manuscripts would not survive time in history. He had a plan prepared already to continue to preserve the words that were originally written down. So, and you guys know the answer to this, but do we have any of the original manuscripts? And the answer is no. There's no museum. None hidden in the Vatican library anywhere that we are aware of. We have no place in the world where we have found not even one original manuscript. The latest one written by the Apostle John, the book of Revelation. We don't... Now, we have documents written in various languages that date back to even before the time of John. The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written before the time of Christ. And they were preserved in clay jars out in this very arid land so that humanity never got to these scrolls to decay them, to mold them and destroy them or anything like that. They found them in pretty good shape. So we actually have documents that are older than what the book of Revelation would be, but for some reason we don't have the original book of Revelation. Now imagine that. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you say, I just want to hear from you. Why do you think God just allowed all of the originals to just disappear? Why do you think? And I won't make fun of your answer. I don't care how silly it is. Because mine's probably sillier than yours. Why do you think God allowed those originals to just disappear? Anybody got a theory? Well, you and I are the same kind of silliness. Because that's exactly... I mean, the Catholic Church has what they call the Shroud of Turin. The Catholic Church has what they believe to be. And what they say is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ with His image somehow projected on it well that's not possible because that shroud is all one cloth and we know from the scriptures that what they covered jesus with was two different cloths one that covered his body and one that they wrapped around his head it's two different cloths so i don't believe the shroud of turin was the cloth the burial cloth of jesus christ okay i think it was manufactured but every now and then the catholic church in turin that's where it's stored. We'll pull this thing out, display it. Catholics will come from around the world to go and pray to this idol image on this piece of cloth. And you're exactly right. I think you're right. I think if the Catholic Church had an original manuscript, they would pull that thing out and people would be bowing and they'd want to touch it. And they would, want, they would think that there was some magic power in that piece of paper. They would worship the paper and not even think twice about the words that were on that paper. So you, can't, you think the same silly way that I do. Okay? But the truth of it is, we, again, we have documents older than the book of Revelation, but for some reason, we don't even have a copy and we don't have the original of the book of Revelation. We don't, they don't exist anywhere. But God still preserved his word. So here's what is amazing to me is that practically 
every denomination, practically every Bible college, every ministry, and most churches will say, we believe in the full and complete inspiration of the Holy Bible in the original manuscripts. But they stop right there. But the fact of it is, then if you ask them, do you believe the Bible is pure? And they say yes, they're lying because that Bible that, be, that they believe in does not exist anywhere. So then the question is, how can we even be sure in any translation that we're reading that we have such a thing as the word of truth? How can we believe that if we don't believe that God preserved every single word. Okay? 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So Paul is saying here that what Paul wrote down actually has higher authority than any person who claims to be spiritual or a prophet. And understand this, and I've, I've mentioned this before about someone asking me if we had a house prophet, someone who hears from God, who stands up and says, oh, God's telling me something right now. It doesn't matter if we had 20 of them here. According to that verse, none of them, none of what they would say would supersede the authority of what the Apostle Paul had already written down. None of it does. The Bible is of the highest authority and there is no authority higher than that. Galatians 1.20 Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. If, it's, if Paul wrote it down, none of it's a lie. Revelation 1.11 Jesus saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, and Ephesus, and Smyrna, and Pergamos, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, you don't want to know what's up, something interesting? These seven churches no longer exist. These seven churches no longer exist. They're not, they're not, they, the people died out, the churches went pagan or whatever. But the words that were written to these churches outlasted these churches. Okay? But he said, write it in a book. Don't just say the words to, to a messenger boy. Send him running and hope that he gets it right. Write it, John, write them down. Write them down. Uh, so that was a method of transmission where we're talking about that now. Here's original manuscripts. And I want you to think about this. They were written on two different forms. One was papyrus. One was vellum. And I'll explain that. Papyrus was where we, it's where we get the word paper. And they would take this reed, this real thick reed that grew in the marsh and the swamps. And it was like grass. And it, was, it always grew in these layers. And they would take the reeds and cut them off. Cut all the leaves off. And then take a knife and split, split it down the middle. And then take each layer. And then they would very carefully weave those layers together. And then lay them, stretch them out. And lay them in the sun and let them dry and cure. And you had papyrus, you had papers, first paper. Okay, that's how they, that's what they wrote on. Or vellum is like the skin of sheep or cattle or any kind of, any kind of skin. A very thin skin, they would take the skin and they would prepare it, dry it out, scrape it. If you've ever done, if you've ever tanned hides or anything like that you know what's involved in it there's you got to scrape all that goo off and you got to salt it out real good and there's a whole process but they would take that and they would use that to write on okay but 
even if they were very careful in handling them, over the years, those things would corrupt. Pieces would break off. If you've got an old Bible, okay, the guy, by the way, the, the man that sent me the Bible from 1720, you have to tell me where to send it back to because I still have it, if you're watching, all right? I, and I loved it, by the way, but it's not my Bible. I've got to send it back to you, but you have to remind me who you are. And I told the guy when he sent it to me, you'll have to call me and tell me. It's time to send it back now because I'll, I'll forget. Okay, but I've got a Bible in there printed in, uh, seven, I think, 1712 maybe. The guy who owned it wrote down the date 1720, but it was printed in 1712. But it's in pretty rough shape. We have to be careful turning the pages. The paper gets brittle, and then it starts decaying, okay? So this is why we don't have any original manuscripts. It's because what they're written on corrupts. Just like us and our bodies, when the Word of God is written in us, our bodies are decaying and corrupting even as we speak. And if all we had was the knowledge of the Word of God without it being written down, when we died off, no one would have the Word of God after we left. The Native Americans and the Aborigines in Australia and different cultures around the world, they have little things where the elders sit and tell stories to the younger children. They're telling of their heritage, they're telling of their gods, they're telling of their religion. And it's all passed down orally. And what's interesting is that to this day you have Native American, First Nations up in Canada. They have stories of giants. But we can't count on those stories to be reliable because they're all oral tradition. And we know what happens to stories over time. They all get changed. All of them do. So God said, I'm going to write it down so that it's memorialized and preserved so in isaiah 40 here's what here's what god did turn to isaiah 40 god had a plan and to anybody to anybody who would say i believe the bible is inspired in the original manuscripts but i do not believe that there is any perfect bible today i will show you from scripture where you're wrong where i used to believe that i was wrong and remember what paul said all scripture is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction well i had to have my doctrine on the bible corrected because what i learned in bible college was since the original manuscripts are gone we don't have any perfect bibles anywhere they don't exist but the scripture then corrected that in me and now i believe that, oh yes, we do have perfect Word of God in our time. So he said in Isaiah 40, verse 6, The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass. So you have vellum, which is flesh, and papyrus, which is grass. And then he said, All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So God said this. You, I told you to write it down in a roll of a book. You wrote it on papyrus, you wrote it on vellum, you wrote it on animal skins. That's You did what I told you to do. But understand that over time, those scrolls are not going to endure. They're not going to last. God did not rub them with some secret powder that preserved them forever. He allowed them to corrupt. He allowed them to break into pieces and blow away as the dust. Because God had a plan to preserve those words far past the original manuscripts. 
God had that planned all along. So if you go to uh, 1 Peter, turn there. 1 Peter, while you're turning there, I'll read this. Out of 66 books from 40 authors, not a single original manuscript survives. If the Word of God is only in the original manuscripts, then Isaiah 40, verse 8, cannot be true. It cannot be true. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And now Peter's going to quote Isaiah 40, verse 8. As his illustration. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is. The word is. I know Bill Clinton doesn't understand what that word means. But do you understand what the word is means? It means right now, at this present time, is current. This is the word which by the gospel, is preached unto you. So I go back to that verse I read in Ecclesiastes 12. The words, the preacher sought out acceptable words to preach. The preacher went looking for a sermon to preach. He needed the words to say. And he realized he didn't have them to say from his own mind. So he had to go to the words of truth. To say them, the upright words, the acceptable words. He had to use the word of God to preach to his people because he realizes that he himself has no power to change anybody's life. But the word of God does. And the word of God was, God had it already figured out that he was going to preserve every word past the original manuscripts. That was always his plan. No matter how old the manuscript got, eventually it would fade away. Again, why don't we have even a piece, one page out of any of the original manuscript of the Bible? Why don't we have one page of it? Doesn't that seem odd to you? Okay. What we don't. And I think God, along with our theory, Brother George, that man would worship it, God is sending message to the churches. Hey, it was written on corruptible things, but I'm the preserver. I can preserve every one of my words past those originals. That was his plan all along. So here's what Dallas Theological Seminary says. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, by which we understand the whole Bible is inspired in the sense that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of scripture. We believe that this divine inspiration extends equally and fully to all parts of the writings, historical, poetical, doctrinal, and prophetical, as appeared in the original manuscripts. We believe that the whole Bible in the originals is therefore without error. That is a contradiction in terms. They would have, they said, the whole Bible in the originals is the, without error. But the originals don't exist. So that now they have to change it to was without error. Because the originals don't exist. They only believe in a Bible that they can't prove ever existed. They can't prove it because we don't have any originals. Bob Jones University. We believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of the Bible in the original manuscripts. And we believe that God has supernaturally preserved every one of His inspired words for us today. However, we have never taken the position that there, there can only be one good translation in the English language. They're supposed to be conservative. Campus Crusade for Christ. The sole basis of our belief is the Bible, God's infallible word, the 66 books of the Old New Testaments, we believe that it was uniquely and verbally and fully inspired by the Holy Spirit and that it was written without error, inerrant in the original manuscripts. But then they stop right there. And they do not extend that inspiration nor that perfection in any translation currently today. Uh, other ministries. We believe the Bible is the word of God fully inspired and without error in the original manuscripts. 
Now, again, I believe those originals were inspired, but we don't have them. So these, all of these ministries, all of these churches, all these seminaries, all of these things all over the world say, we believe the Bible is inspired word of God, but only in the original manuscripts. But if you would ask them, do you believe that we have a perfect translation today? Absolutely not. We don't. And that, my friends, is a lie. According to the word of, not according to what I said, but according to what Calvary Chapel. We believe that the scriptures, the Old and New Testaments are the word of God fully inspired without error in the original manuscripts. Only the original manuscripts. So, uh, doctrine number two. Since we don't have the originals, and God swore that the word of the Lord would endure forever, then we must believe that every word that was on those originals was faithfully copied to newer manuscripts. We have to believe that. So 1 Peter 1, 23, verse 25, we just read that, the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So according to Peter, Peter still had the inerrant word of God. But we know he didn't have original manuscripts. We know that. So what did he have? He had copies. But he said that his copy was still the inerrant, inspired word, the incorruptible word of God, and that it would endure forever. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the... Turn to Psalm 12 while I'm reading this. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. The, the things which are revealed in Deuteronomy, he said, they belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may, that we may do all the words of this law. We spend, I don't know how much I don't know how much money we spend as a nation in the building of the National Archives preserving the three primary documents that formed our nation. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. They're in this main hall in the, um, what I just said, that building. They're on display, and we spend a lot of money every year preserving those documents. Because that's the foundation of our nation. We should never, ever forget that we are a constitutional republic. We're a representative republic. We are not a democracy. Representative republic. We vote on representatives who are supposed to have our interest in mind. And... According to those documents, if our government turns against us, the people, then we have all rights to overturn that government. Amen. Okay? So, the National Archives, we are very careful to preserve, like I said, everything that's said in Senate hearings, Senate debates, House of Representatives, Supreme Court rulings, Everything of our government is meticulously written down and preserved. All the words of the law so that we could do all the words of the law. Okay? And it's the same with the Bible. Psalm 12. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here tonight. Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words. That word are keeps it as always perpetually present tense. They are right now pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, all of them. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Isaiah 30, verse 8, Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. 
So now God is establishing. Now that he's, now that he's made sure that we understand that every word that those prophets spoke was the exact words that God wanted. Now God is establishing the, the biblical doctrine of the preservation of every single word. Jesus said, not even one jot and one tittle shall pass from this law till all be fulfilled. Not even the smallest part of any of the letters would pass away. Not one. Until it was all fulfilled. And I'm of the firm belief that rather than scriptures only being preserved in the originals, I'm of the firm belief that as we draw nearer to the end and the fulfillment of every prophecy in the Bible, that those words are more important now than they ever were before. So while I don't believe that the King James corrects the Hebrew Old Testament, the Greek New Testament, I do believe that these words are more important now than they have ever been even in the time of their writing. Because Paul lays out the case that the Old Testament writers, they were writing things that they knew they would never see. They would never be able to see the things that they were prophesying of. But we would see them. And how would we know they were prophesied of? They're written down in the Scriptures. So God now is going to lay the case out for the preservation of every single word. I don't believe we've lost one word. I don't believe that. 